Ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to the final score with Matthew and Stevie Fly. What's up, guys? The final score is back again. And guys, to say I'm excited about this interview tonight is an understatement. I have got one of the legendary Washington Redskins, commanders, whatever you want to call them now. One of the greats. He was selected as one of the 70 greatest uh, commanders of all time back in 2002. And just recently got, in 2022, got inducted into the Washington Commanders Ring of Fame. And guys, you see this guy on your TV at least once a year. When Super Bowl comes around and they're playing these iconic Super Bowl plays, uh, you you see Gary O'Yoprimian trying to bounce whatever he was trying to do. I don't know what he was trying to do, but he knocks the ball up in the air and Mike Bass takes it back for a touchdown. And uh, unfortunately for Washington fans, that was the only score of the game. And Miami finishes the season perfect. But with me tonight is the guy that took that pass back. Uh, took that interception back for a touchdown, Mr. Mike Bass. Mr. Bass, welcome to the show. Well, thanks so much, Stevie. I appreciate your asking me to be on. Well, thank you. Thank you for coming. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's an honor because, you know, like I told you when we talked on the phone, I'm a Steelers fan, but I'm like the black sheep of the family there because <laughs> everybody else pretty much is is a Redskins or Commanders fan now. Um, but, yeah, it, it's – I'm I'm well versed in that history of the Washington football team, so I know all about you. So you were you were born in Ypsilanti, Michigan. So yeah, growing up, it's actually called Ypsilanti. Ypsilanti, excuse Ypsilanti, me. I'm sorry. That's right. I give it uh, credos every time I'm on uh, wherever. It's a is little a, town right outside of uh, Ann Arbor. Is that a small town? Uh, well, it used to be. It's gotten a lot bigger. Ypsilanti and Ann Arbor are almost joined together. Joined together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm in a small town in eastern North Carolina. You won't believe how small this town is now. This is, we've got about 95 people here. <laughs> I, I love the small town, but I love it. I, I grew up here and I, and I love it. I came back and I love it. So growing up, I'm sure you were a football fan. Now, who were you pulling for as far as a team or who were some of your favorite players growing up? Well, uh, quite frankly, as a being from a small town close to Ann Arbor, the University of Michigan was always uh, on our radar. Now, the, uh, we also followed the Lions, and in particular, uh, Alex Karras and that, that bunch, uh, uh, Joe Schmidt and so forth. Uh, but they, even then, except for, I think, 1957, they have been perennial losers for for fifty some. Pretty hours. much, pretty much. It's not. It hadn't been a good time to be a Lions fan. Yeah, but the other teams that we really followed uh, were the Cleveland Browns with uh, Jim Brown, the right. Chicago Bears, and and the Packers. But they were always somewhat in the same area. We didn't follow the Steelers too much, but of course, <laughs> the, those others you know, we definitely followed. Back then, back then, the Steelers weren't weren't on anybody's radar. I would think they were not having the success that that soon followed them in the seventies for yeah. sure. Um, so, growing in high school, I, I know you uh, you were a three sport athlete. You did football, basketball, and track and field. Mm -hmm. When was it that you knew? Okay, football is going to take me to the next level. Well, uh, I started playing football, touch football. Well, when I was seven or eight years old and growing up in a small town, you know that everybody knows everybody else. Yeah. And so there was a small, there was a group of us who always played with or against each other, no matter what the sport was. But it seemed like football kind of brought us all together, recognizing that football is the ultimate st uh, team sport. No one player uh can do without the other and and uh this is it's true uh it was true then it's true now but at some point in time you have to get a feel for what kind of athlete you might be and i played all sorts of sports 
but my mother was a, a real football fan. <laughs> and and she said, you know, M Michael, and they always called me Michael, uh, we don't care what you do, but we want you to go out for football. We don't care whether you make the team, but just go out for football. And she loved football. And uh, she was probably more knowledgeable than I w could ever hope to be. <laughs> and it's so ironic that uh, my girlfriend at the time, who's my wife now, uh, became such a football fan that they challenged each other in terms of how much, how much they knew. And all I could do was sit back as they challenged me uh, on just about everything. So as you, as you learn uh, down through the years uh, that uh, you be quiet and you let them do their thing. <laughs> and I learned exactly, that. Happy, exactly. Happy wife, you know what I mean. <laughs> yep, I've been married 24 years now, so I know I know exactly what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. It's like you told me when we were talking on the phone, just like what you just said. Happy, happy wife, happy life. So yeah, that's, definitely. definitely. <laughs> I hear you there. I hear you there. So, favorite favorite moment in high school, as far as football goes, what was your favorite moment as a football player? Yeah. We, we were a small town, few, uh, seven miles uh, from Ann Arbor, and probably the greatest moment in, in high school was our beating the, the rival, Ann Arbor High School, that we had lost to for 40 years. <laughs> and and uh, in my junior year, uh, we quite frankly won that game with the same quarterback that I had uh, grown up with playing with uh, a fellow by the name of Tom Hall, who he and I remain friends even today. And we see each other two or three times a year and we talk uh, once or twice a month and we're always checking on each other. Uh, there are, but you know, it's so ironic that in high school, there were probably players who may have been better athletes, but uh, for some reason or another, they took a different path. And uh, so I consider myself very, very fortunate to have had the parents that I had and uh, who pushed me in the right direction to the point where uh, at some point in time, you acknowledge the fact that they know more than we know. And we are always trying to get to where they've already been. Exactly. I couldn't put it, said it better myself. You're exactly right. So... I know recruiting was a little bit different back in the day, uh, but what schools? I know you end up you end up at Michigan, but what schools were? What other schools were on your radar besides Michigan? Well, uh, I went all over the country looking at schools, uh, uh, even the uh, uh, West Point and the Air Force Academy, uh, Michigan State, of course, uh, the other Big Ten schools, Ohio State. Uh, uh, but it came down to uh, my uh, folks saying you have two plans in place. You have a plan A and you have a plan B. And plan A was education, uh, getting that, getting into college, getting that education. And plan B would be your sport, football or what have you. And I played uh, football. Uh, aside from football, I played basketball and ran track, but uh, it was going to a school that was going to give me uh, a, a sound foundation, recognizing that uh, even stepping off the curb, you could uh, break an ankle and your career is over. So you had to really, that backup plan really wasn't a backup plan. That backup plan was, was A, plan A, which was going to school. At the end, of course, you can't get a better degree than from the University of Michigan. Right. Definitely. So, like you said, you just answered my next question, what made you pick Michigan? So, that, that you took care of that. First impressions when you get to Michigan, what was it like when you stepped on campus? <laughs> that there were a lot of All-American football players. <laughs> 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 you know, I was a big fish in a small pond, but then going to Michigan, uh, man, oh man, oh man! Uh, there was just some great, great, great athletes. Uh, 
and many of them went into the uh, National Football League after graduation. But I went into Michigan as a running back. And yeah, I saw that. I was, yeah. was going to ask you about that. How, how did that come about playing running back? Well, uh, in high school, uh, because I, I had uh, a monicum of speed, uh, I was a runner. And I ran the ball and never learned how to do anything else. <laughs> Uh, but run the football and know where my holes were, know who to follow and so forth and so on. But then when I got to Michigan, uh, I had to learn to block. And uh, I wasn't very good at it. I really wasn't very good at it. But I, uh, it, I was fortunate that the defensive backfield coach at the time was Don James. Don James was, uh, actually went on to become – the head coach at the University of Washington, and he yeah. did extremely well. But it was during my sophomore year that he switched me to the right cornerback spot, and there was an opening there, and I, I, I ended up winning the starting spot uh, in my junior year, and so I was a starter in my junior year and in my senior year. Right. And in addition to that, we were in the same – in, the, in my same backfield uh, was uh, John Rouser, who was drafted by the Packers and went on to, to play with, uh, with the, the Steelers, and also Rick Volk, who ended up uh, going to Baltimore. So three out of the four defensive backs uh, in this uh, with Don James went on to play NFL football, and we all graduated that same year. Yeah. And how hard was it to make that switch, though? I mean, you, you talked about it at running back. You just knew your holes and who to follow. How hard was it learning the defenses and the coverages for you? Well, uh, just the fact that I'd never played defense before, right. yeah, made me made me study, made me uh, really perfect the fundamentals uh, of trying to run backwards as fast as you run forward, uh, uh, knowing. Uh, the angles to take when you're when you're going to make a tackle, and knowing the defenses, uh, every aspect of the defense that you're running at the time, not only your own responsibilities but also understanding the responsibilities of those that you depend on, uh, the linebackers on your side, the safeties on your side, using the the sidelines, all these things were developed. Uh, in college, and I utilized these things even in those 10 years that I was in the pros. Yeah. They came, the fundamentals were the basis. You didn't have to be an exceptional athlete, but you had to be an athlete that knew what you were doing and that you didn't make mental mistakes. Right. I, I'll tell you this. I played – I was a very undersized offensive lineman in high school. I played center. But and I couldn't overpower anybody. I knew that, but my footwork was what I worked on. My my yeah. power step and, and that stuff. And came back years. I, I'm a coach there at my school now. I'm the head coach. But come back before I was head coach, one of the uh, one of the coaches of the junior varsity team right there got me to come over there and show his offensive lineman footwork. And I heard him say, "Now that guy played offensive line." And he knew his fundamentals. And it's so important. I can't stress enough to those kids knowing the fundamentals. Because like you said, you don't have to be that exceptional athlete. But as long as you know what you're doing and, and work on those fundamentals, you, you can be really good. I mean, that's okay. no doubt about it. I constantly uh, refer to uh, what we call the three Bs. Be where you're supposed to be. Be doing what you're supposed to be doing while you're there and be there when you're supposed to be there. Exactly. And, and, and those things are always constant in my mind, those three Bs. And uh, as a defensive back, it's impossible for you to cover the these wide receivers everywhere. That's why you know, you've got to utilize all of those things and really fundamentally watching film to see if you can pick up certain things. But at the same time, uh, learning the fundamentals of your position as well as uh, those positions of those people or those that are going to help you 
particularly uh, as, as you go up the ladder in playing. And like you said, you don't have to be an exceptional athlete, but you have to be an athlete that uh, uh, you've made yourself uh, based on the fundamentals and not making mental errors. Exactly. Exactly. So you guys, that 1964 season, you guys finished nine and one. You you win the talk about winning the Rose Bowl over Oregon State. What was that like for you? You know, you're this uh, small town kid come to Michigan, and then you switch to defense, and you guys end up going nine and one and winning the Rose Bowl. How big of a thrill was that for you? What an absolute thrill! We played in we we remember. I remember going. I was a sophomore then. And I didn't get on the field that much, but I did get into that game. And just looking at a going to Michigan, you got used to large crowds. Right. Um, there were 101,001 seats at the at Michigan Stadium, the, the 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 big house. But going just going to Pasadena in the dead of winter with palm trees and all the, the it was just an amazing, amazing. Uh, experience and anybody who has ever had an opportunity to play in a bowl game the rose bowl is a game that you really want to play in that i mean anytime you play and you know nowadays i think just about every team almost makes a bowl game they got a bowl game for every everything so it's kind of dampened that spirit but i say now if you make a bowl game after January 1st, you're doing pretty good. That's got to be a big thrill for you. Absolutely. And uh, uh, in California, they just treated us like kings. As a matter of fact, that is the first time that I ever uh, saw Arnold Palmer. Oh, uh, really? Yeah, the very first time at a, at a banquet there that they had for us. And uh, that's uh, – and this was – Early on, too, in, in, in Palmer's career, so to speak, uh, uh, it was it was here you hear about these people, but you never think you're going to you're going to get a chance to see. Them. Exactly. Exactly. And I got a chance to to uh, to see Arnold Palmer for the very first time. Wow. That, that's that's awesome there. So you go on to be a college all star in 1967, uh, your career at. At Michigan comes to end. What is what would you say was the best memory that you had at Michigan? Well, I think uh, as I as I think about it, I, I there are good and and bad things. <laughs> I remember getting beat uh, against Northwestern for a sixty yard touchdown, oh, and wow. it was a that stands out in my mind. Yeah, something like that will stick out in your head for sure. Yeah, but I think my, the, the greatest experiences I had at Michigan dealt with the fact that I played with such great, great athletes. Uh, Tom Mack, who was in the Hall of Fame, he went to the Rams. Uh, Rick Volk, as I mentioned, John Rosler, as I mentioned, uh, uh, Frank Nunley, uh, who was from a small town close to Ypsilanti called Belleville. He went to the, the 49ers. We just had some some great guys. Carl Ward, who was a running back uh, out of Cincinnati. Uh, so it was uh, really the the relationships that I developed at Michigan uh, are still uh, very strong today. Uh, so uh, winning tops everything, no matter what uh, the situation might be. Winning and and in a team sport. Uh, where everybody is dependent on everybody else doing their job, uh, it it lasts for a lifetime. And and I know you played, like you said, you played basketball, you ran track. I played basketball and baseball. But and no offense to those other sports, but <laughs> there is nothing that unites a, a, eleven guys together like football. Like you said, every guy depends on the all the other guys on the field. But like you said, those relationships you had at Michigan still stand to this day. I have relationships with with guys I played with. What now? It's been thirty two years ago. The last time I played, and and still, it may it may have been guys you didn't like Monday through Friday, Monday through Thursday. But on Friday night when I played with them, they were my brothers. And mm -hmm. you know, still, 
my wife gets on me all the time because <laughs> I can forget what to get at the grocery store. But yeah. I can tell you what happened in this game that I haven't played in 30 years. I can tell you play by play what's getting ready to happen. She yeah. said, how yeah. is it? I said, it's football. Mm-hmm. It's football. Well, I might correct you in <clears throat> stating that it, it, it's not 11, it's 22. Oh, yeah, exactly. It's right. 22 guys who are starting. But, again, uh, I always – and this happens when you're not a starter or you're sitting on the bench – that those fellows who are not the starters deserve just as much credit as those fellows who are the starters because those non-starters are the ones who are getting re- getting you ready exactly. to be victorious. And in that regard, uh, I take my hat off to those fellows who normally sit the bench, uh, letting them know how much they're appreciated and always encouraging them to uh, uh, understand that on any given day or game, you might be called on. And as a result, you've got to always be ready. At the same time, uh, when you speak with the starters, and I've coached a little football myself, yeah, you got to let them know, too, that there's somebody behind them who would love to take their spot. Exactly. 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 So NFL draft comes along. 1967. You're you are picked by the Packers in the 12th round. Now, I know Coach Lombardi was there. Mm-hmm. You, how long did you stay there? Because you, that same year, you were sold to Detroit. Yeah. So how long did you end up staying in Green Bay? Well, it's really ironic. My, I was on pins and needles and didn't get drafted until the second day, the 12th round, as you as you stated, and. Uh, uh, my teammate, John Rouser, was uh, drafted earlier than, than me, but we both went to Green Bay to compete for a position. And there were other defensive backs there that were drafted uh, before me uh, as well. And, but as things would have it, uh, and based on really the fundamentals that I concentrated on in college uh, were very evident to Coach Lombardi. And uh, I went through the entire, entire uh, training season and uh, I got cut, the very last cut. Oh, wow. Yeah, and couldn't go really to another team uh, uh, because all the rosters had been set when, and that's what happens. And in Green Bay, uh, not only had they drafted John ahead of me, who was a fantastic defensive back, but they also had three all pros in their defensive oh, yeah. backfield. That was uh, 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 Herb Adderley, Willie Wood, and Bob Jeter. So uh, a lot of times it's being in the right place at the right time. Well, I was in the wrong place. Uh, but fortunate and Uh, as is the case in what makes Coach Lombardi the great coach that he was, uh, he pulled me aside and he said, Mike, uh, don't give up. You can play in this league. And that stood, I I remembered that. And uh, because when I got cut, I was ready to go back and uh, get my master's degree and so forth at Michigan. But when he said that, and at the same time, the Lions picked me up. Uh, I said, okay, I'm not going to give up. I'm going to continue. And so I went uh, to the Lions, and I remained on their taxi squad for two years. But during that period of time, uh, I was trying to oust or uh, Dick LeBeau. Yeah, Dick LeBeau, Steelers defensive coordinator, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so – I remained, uh, but I knew, I really felt during that period of time that I could play. And I proceeded to, to, to write to other clubs asking for an opportunity after that second year in, in Detroit. And that's when Coach Lombardi came out of retirement for that, that one year. And the minute he got my letter, he called. And talked <laughs> about a call 
uh, that I've never expected to get. He called and he said, Mike, I want you to come to Washington. And I jumped at the chance. Uh, the Lions didn't really want to let me go, but uh, uh, they essentially had no no choice, really, uh, because it was either that, as far as I was concerned, or I retired. But I was not going to stick around for a third year on their cab squad when I knew that I that I, I could play this game, play this position, and play it at the highest level. What I mean, what a Great feeling that must have been for. I mean, even at the time, Coach Lombardi was such a legendary coach. With all that success he had with Green Bay, and then to come back, and then you get a phone call from him. Mm -hmm. That had to make you feel like you were on cloud nine when you get a call from Vince Lombardi saying, "I want you to come to Washington." Absolutely, and and at the time, Washington was a perennial loser, and. Uh, I felt like I was going to get a fair shot. That's right. all any of us want is a fair opportunity. And I was just trying to make the team. And uh, when I walked uh, into training camp, there was Sonny Jurgensen. Uh, there was Sam Huff. <laughs> uh, just legendary players that I had uh, seen when I was just a kid, so to speak. And uh, during that first week of training camp, the fellow ahead of me uh, made a mental error. And Coach Lombardi said, Mike, get in there. <laughs> and I, 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 I won that starting position. I worried throughout training camp, and I would constantly uh, talk, quite frankly, with two people, Sam Huff and Bobby Mitchell. Who Bobby Mitchell was uh, on the team as well. It was his last year. And I didn't feel relief until uh, really about the third or fourth uh, exhibition game. And when Coach Lombardi put me in there, I ended up playing 104 straight consecutive games. Yep, the rest is history. What, what was it like playing with Sam Huff? Uh, Sam was the ultimate pro, absolutely. And uh, the old rugged, guy, so to speak, no teeth, <laughs> a real, a real throwback, but uh, so energetic, even at his age, he again, loved this game. And that's the case, I think, with so many of the pros, uh, you love this game to the point where you probably would play for nothing if they were just going to give you a, a, a t-shirt. <laughs> it, it, it was that's what it was like back then right and uh, my first salary was twelve thousand dollars <laughs> can you imagine what the look well, half now, nowadays would give if they said okay we're going to give you twelve thousand dollars they would <laughs> yeah. nah, ain't no way ain't no way <laughs> you're right but yeah i i i, I just love i think because mr huff was one of the first to be mic'd up back in the day this yeah. is the boys of Washington. They love watching that over and over again with him. And you can hear, you can hear his intensity on the field. You can, you oh, can yeah. see his passion. But uh, another guy that played in the backfield in the secondary with you, Pat Fisher. Uh, what was it like playing with Pat Fisher? Well, he, uh, I was on the right side. Pat was on the left side. He himself is legendary because he was only five seven, five eight, uh, tough as nails, and a real student of the game. And again, his fundamentals were impeccable. And he learned uh, early on that, and, and I did too, that on a, on a foot race, we're not going to uh, be able to outrun these uh, uh, exceptional wide receivers. And so again, it goes back to uh, uh, your fundamentals and studying. Uh, and if you maintain those fundamentals they will they will carry you through to the point where you're able to compete and uh, from a defensive point of view it is a matter of working together uh, and and knowing where the weaknesses are not only in the defense but your own weaknesses right and uh, we often use the term 
that linemen and linebackers make six yard mistakes, but defensive backs make six point mistakes. Exactly. And 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 so when you have a veteran defensive backfield that I played in, uh, we were able to depend on each other and know just with voice commands uh, uh, what was going on and where we could expect the help. And we could also see where the holes are. It's amazing. Uh, I played for 10 years. First five years, I was still learning. The second five years, the game slowed down to the point where a peak towards uh, at, at the start of the play, you're able to see certain things that gave you an idea of what was going to be happening on that particular play, run or pass. And that's something I try to tell my my players too. We look at a lot of film, and I say play recognition. When you see these these formations come out, then you know as much as we've looked at this film, you know what might be coming. Prepare yourself for it. Know what you've got to do if that does happen. Did you guys feel like this was a you know? Of course, this is your first year there, but did the team feel like when Lombardi was there, this was going to be a turnaround? There was more confidence there. Than it was because you said, like you said, they were perennial loser before the, before that. But I mean, the the one year he's there, you guys finished seven five and two, which is a good turnaround for what they had. But did you guys feel like okay, we're 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 on the way here? Oh, absolutely. Uh, Coach Lombardi, as tough as he was, he made everybody accountable. There were no prima donnas. Uh, he would jump on Sonny as as quickly as he would jump on that, that that rookie that was just coming in. Again, uh, Coach Lombardi didn't have a lot of plays, but you ran those plays to perfection. Exactly. And you ran them over and over and over again uh, against different, uh, different de- uh, defenses in terms of uh, on the defensive side of the ball. Again, uh, you watched film, and he put a lot of pressure on us. But it was the pressure that uh, a father might put on you to the point where uh, what you're doing is trying to please him, trying to get Coach Lombardi to say, good job, Mike. Good job, Sonny. So that the the practices were tough, hard. You knew you were going to be called out if you made uh, mental errors or if you didn't hustle. so that the games became easy. You almost relished the games and you almost wanted to take out your own uh, frustrations that you might have felt in practice during the week on that team that you were that you were playing against. And uh, gradually, as we had some success and then more success and then more success uh, with two veteran players like uh, Sam Huff, for example, uh, uh, you began to see and feel the confidence building so that you did, went into a game knowing that, well, we're going to win rather than a maybe. And right. we, never, we never got down if we got down uh, uh, in the score. Uh, we felt like we always could come back. What was it like playing with Sonny Jurgensen? Uh, he threw the – First of all, you you felt like he was a general out there. He was an extension of Coach Lombardi, and he himself said that he learned more in in the, those first in that year with Coach Lombardi that he had uh, learned in the ten years before. Uh, how, in fact, uh, he taught keys and so forth, rather than just throwing the ball because a man was open. He learned you threw the spots. The timing had to be there, uh, and he didn't necessarily have to see uh, the ball completed uh, based on what he learned, again, by watching film, that uh, he knew where to go with the ball, uh, aside from, of course, being able to change plays at the line of scrimmage. How devastating was it when you guys find out that Coach Lombardi is going to retire and he's sick? Uh, which I think I, I'm not sure. Just reading up what I did, I think he tried to keep it a little private on his sickness. But 
How how devastating was that to the team when he when he goes out? It was it was it was bad. Uh, we would practice at uh, during the summer before training camp uh, at uh, one of the fields at uh, Georgetown University. And while he was in the hospital, his uh, hospital room overlooked the field. And uh, a couple of times, uh, he actually uh, would be driven down to the field just to give us some encouragement. But we could see uh, that he was getting weaker and weaker. And uh, it got to the point where uh, I remember Sonny saying, the coach Lombardi just said, Sonny, this hurts. And uh, uh, we knew that he was not going to make it. And, and that year that we played after his death was devastating. We went back. Uh, the push just wasn't there. Right. We were always, uh, he was always in the back of our minds. And there was some, uh, it was just the, the lack of confidence that we felt in ourselves and the dependence that we had on him. Uh, and it did take its toll. It did take its toll. Yeah, definitely. You guys, uh, of course, Bill Austin sits in for a year and then George Allen comes along. What was your first impressions of George Allen? <laughs> we thought George was a kook. <laughs> <laughs> he was so enthusiastic. He was like a, a, a college coach, but he was so enthusiastic. And in the beginning, we thought that it was just bogus. I mean, we're all old pros. We're <laughs> this, we're that. And he just brought, uh, he just brought such enthusiasm and such confidence uh, to the team. And from a defensive point of view, he made us feel like uh, we were at the at the at the top of the hill. Defense, defense, defense. You can't lose if the other team can't score. Exactly. And 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 he indoctrinated us in uh, thriving to outscore the offense. That is with uh, uh, turnovers and interceptions and fumbles and stopping people on third down. It got to be where uh, the offense was a little jealous of us. <laughs> and especially when you had on offense, you had Sonny, you had Billy Kilmer, you had Charlie Taylor, you had Roy yeah. Jefferson, Larry Brown, and so forth. But they were afterthoughts as far as Coach Lombardi, or as far as Coach Allen was concerned. And it, the old joke was that uh, uh, George Allen will tell the offense, okay, offense, go on in there and hold them. We'll take care of it after that. <laughs> 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 That's this really cool there. and we uh, we could understand why uh, uh rookies just could not make it in george's defense uh, and some of the things i'll tell you about uh, just made it so 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 real uh because uh there were so many different combinations and uh, this is where i learned to take that peak uh, just a just a quick peek where I could see on my side and not only the the center but the quarterback but also the onside guard the onside tackle the near back and the tight end with it with just a half a second peek before I got my hands my eyes back on the receiver and I could tell where the hole was going to be uh uh, with that, uh, the pattern that the defense that the uh, receiver was running, because they weren't going to have two receivers in the same spot. Exactly. And we could eat, we could change defenses uh, just by listening listening to to Hamburger Chris, who called them after Jack Pardee retired, uh, and we could change defenses after the snap of the ball, uh, just by picking up the voice. Uh, of of uh, Chris, so it made a, it made a difference, and so we recognize rookies. 
Let George said, let somebody else train him. I'll get him after five years. <laughs> what it what wasn't the nickname for y'all seeing the over the hill gang? Was that yeah, what they called it? Over the hill gang. We were all uh, 30 years old or, or more. It took us a hundred years to run a hundred day a hundred yard dash. <laughs> <laughs> but but we played a team concept yep. of knowing uh what everybody was going to be doing on our side of the ball from uh, the middle linebacker who might be covering the hook for me or Chris who might be covering the out for me or where the sideline was and how to use that sideline, all these things. And of course I played with uh, on really on my side, not only uh, Pat being on the other side, but there was Brig Owens and in particular, Kenny Houston on my side. Oh yeah, oh, Mike. I I I was in, you know, I was in heaven. I, yeah. I <laughs> took advantage of these things uh, to cover somebody like a, a Bob Hayes or Paul Warfield or some of those great great receivers. Murphy Morris. Yeah, yeah, and it it helped being able to practice every day against Charlie Taylor, Roy Jefferson, Frank Grant. Uh, Jerry Smith, those uh, and Jerry, by the way, should be in the Hall of Fame as a receiver, uh, as a tight end. And of course, we also had uh, Larry Brown and Charlie Harroway. But uh, it was amazing uh, the how fortunate I was to be on that team and to be playing during that period. It's just uh, absolutely amazing. I'm glad you mentioned this name a few minutes ago because he's one of my favorite Washington players of all time. Like I said, as a Steelers fan, the only time you've ever seen documented proof that I wore a Redskins or shirt, but it had Chris Hamburger on the front. Uh -huh. What was it like playing with Chris Hamburger? Again, uh, the consummate pro. Nobody made mistakes, and nobody's ego was so large that uh, – a lowly defensive back like myself couldn't get on Chris because he's supposed to cover the out for me on a particular <laughs> in a particular defense. Well, Chris, you know you get your ass out there where you're supposed to be. It's like I said, uh, be where you're supposed to be, be there when you're supposed to be there, and be doing what you're supposed to be doing while you're there. And so it just made my job so much easier. If I didn't have to cover the out, all I all had to do was worry about really the post or the fly pad. Right. Because if Chris was covering the out, then Harold McClinton was covering the hook area. And I got, I don't know how many interceptions off of things like that, uh, where Staubach, for example, would overthrow uh, the turn in route by the receiver because Harold was there in that hook area. So there's little things like that. So I say the game slows down right. after the first five years. And it's amazing. There is a benefit to experience. You talk about you talked about playing in practice against some of these great players you guys had on offense. And I always believe uh, iron sharpens iron. So when you play against great guys like that, when you get to the game, you're coming up against a guy would say, well, he's no better than Charlie Taylor. He's no better than Larry Brown. What was it like playing with, with Taylor and Brown? Well, uh, again, because uh, uh, both Lombardi and George Allen uh, were synonymous in team, 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 team. It was during these practice sessions that uh, – uh, particularly Charlie and, and, and Roy Jefferson, would tell me where I might have made a mistake on a, on a particular pattern based on a certain defense. And so they constantly helped me. And at the same time, I was helping them if I got the jump on a particular pattern that they were running. So uh, they advised me from the standpoint of, what I might be doing wrong that I might pay attention to, uh, I might have kept my eyes in that backfield a little bit too long. Uh, or I might have taken a false step when I didn't need to take a false step. Uh, sometimes we're playing zone. Uh, all these little things. So with a veteran team, 
where you know that there's nobody coming in that's going to beat you out. Uh, you can pay, play, pay a particular attention and take chances or try different things because you know you're going to be there. And uh, Coach Allen knew that as well. There's no way in the world he could tell me or Pat or Kenny or Brig how to play uh, defense as a defensive back. He could give us concepts and, and, and give us the overall plan. But actually doing it, uh, he let us do what we knew best. And, and that's the, the mark of a, of a great coach. Let them do their thing, point them in the right direction, and respect the fact that they know what they're doing. So at 71, you guys get to the playoffs. You're losing the division round to the 49ers. You're coming off a great year, eight interceptions, uh, going into that 1972 year. Did you guys feel like with Coach Allen there now, okay, this is going to be our year? Was there a, a sense of like, we, yes. we, we can we can do this this year? We've got to the divisional. We can take the next step now. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. We came so close. Uh, it wasn't expected. We won in Coach Allen's uh, first year. And uh, uh, we just felt that we were we were on the road to, to uh, uh, doing great, great things. And uh, again, egos did not play a part. It was the success of the team. And yeah. uh, with the team being success, successful, the individuals will get their due, so to speak. Exactly. And that's, that's where our, our whole focus was. We can't talk about somebody that played for a Washington team football team without talking about the Cowboys rivalry. And that year, uh, I guess, you know, you guys split in the regular season mm -hmm. and then you guys end up playing in the NFC championship game. Talk about that rivalry and how intense that rivalry was back then. Uh, it was George, uh, quite frankly, who made it as intent, intense as it was. He developed such a, I hate to use hate, but such a a, a feeling towards Dallas and there being the America's team, and uh, they're not giving the Redskins their due, even uh, overlooking us, so that we went into the game really trying to annihilate them. And in many instances, we brought those uh, some of the defenses that we had. Uh, uh, were such that we took their receivers out of the game. We annihilated those receivers. We let them know that they were they were in a game. They just were not going to run uh, all over us. And uh, we brought them to their knees, which yeah. is what we wanted to do. And, and I, uh, they uh, they uh, we earned the respect, but no, we commanded the respect. Some people demand it. But we commanded respect just by stepping on that field. And they're knowing that uh, we don't have to yell and scream. We don't have to uh, get each other all pumped up, particularly for when we're playing the Cowboys. Oh, no. Uh, it came automatically. Automatically. I just remember one of my first memories of that besides uh, that year, besides, of course, your highlight from the Super Bowl, uh, your former teammate and great NFL head coach, the late Sam Weiss on the sidelines, mm -hmm. talking about, die, you dirty dog, die. Yeah. And then they showed a picture of him dropping the ball. He said, he died, he died. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so that tells you a little bit of how intense that rivalry was back it then. Was. It was. Um, playing in RFK, mm -hmm. what was it like playing in RFK? Because, you know, I know that place was loud. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The, the, the fans were so close to the field that uh, I could almost uh, uh, walk over and shake hands with some of my good friends who had been uh, on, in those same seats for years. But, and they had an extension that came out a little bit closer to the field. And uh, you could see the, the stands bouncing up and down. Uh, because of uh, uh, of the crowd, 
And uh, uh, there, the fans being so close to the field made a big, big difference. And I had gone to games at in Landover with the 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 other stadium. It's just not like RFK. No. And I I just hope that they find a way to bring the team games back to Washington D.C. proper. That's where the team needs to be, even though the training facilities are out in Virginia somewhere. Yeah. Uh, the fans in Washington deserve to have the team there in Washington. And I know, I know, you know, all sports have become more about the money now. It's all like business. But I wish there was a way that – and there, I know there's a way that they could find a way to get something like that atmosphere that was at RFK mm-hmm. and still have plenty of seats up there. You could still do the same because that was such an advantage for the oh, Washington teams all through the years was the RFK. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and of course, it, RFK they played baseball as well. Right. But uh, uh, that football, RFK as a football stadium, was just absolutely amazing. And and really, uh, those fans become the 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 twelfth man. They exactly. Become the twelfth man on the field, and and we hear them. We heard them. We heard them, and uh, they never really booed us which was unusual. They never really booed us. They they made excuses for us when we lost even. They were so supportive. So you you guys end up winning the NFC East. You go 11 and 3. You you actually lost the last two games going into the playoffs. Mm -hmm. But you get get revenge uh, on the Cowboys for that last loss. NFC Championship game at RFK. You end up winning 24 to 3. Mm-hmm. How I mean I can't imagine we talked about you playing in the Rose Bowl, but you just win the NFC Championship over America's team in <laughs> RFK Stadium. What was the feeling like saying you know we're going to play in the Super Bowl? Well, uh, you're right. We lost those last two games, but they we were in the playoffs. We yeah. knew that, yeah. And uh, I think we had also clinched the, uh, clinched the East. Yeah, we had clinched the East Home field. And so those two games prior to uh, going into the playoffs were used to make corrections, to really understand what we had done wrong. And a couple of them were, uh, I think, fumbles or, 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 or maybe missed tackles or things of that sort. So that uh, in making those corrections, and you can do those with veteran ball players. Uh, that uh, to the point where we didn't get upset, uh, nor did we lose confidence. So we went into the playoffs with a great deal of confidence. We knew that we could beat the, both the Packers and we could beat the Cowboys. We knew we were going to beat the Cowboys no matter what. We were going to bring something on them, to them on that day that I, I don't think anybody could have beat us. Yeah, you guys end up in two – Two of the two playoff games, you give up six points, uh, three three points in each game. Mm-hmm. Now you're facing the undefeated Miami Dolphins. Uh, Don Shula with Bob Greasy, you know, all those legends there in the Super Bowl. Uh, Mercury Morris, Jim mm-hmm. Kick, Larry Zonka, Paul Warfield. That's what you're facing. What was what was your thinking going into that game? You know, because you can be the guy; they can be the first team to have a perfect season, or you yeah. guys can knock them off. Well, uh, first of all, uh, the the Dolphins' success that year was actually because of the play of uh, Earl Moore. Yeah, he took Greasy's place. I remember. Run, won all those games. As a matter of fact, Earl Moore was a. Uh, uh, in Detroit, when I went to Detroit, and he then ended up going to Baltimore, I believe. But uh, uh, he had a fantastic uh, season, and then, uh, but Bob Greasy was their quarterback. I remember playing against Greasy uh, three straight years when he was at Purdue and I was at Michigan, and they beat us those three straight years by a total of five points, all oh, wow. four. All scored by Bob Greasy, who was a tremendous athlete, a tremendous athlete. 
So we go into the Super Bowl, and we were we were favored to win that, quite frankly. Uh, uh, and unfortunately, uh, our our offense wasn't moving uh, in that game, and that was unusual. And uh, we had a veteran team, and I have my own opinion about those things. Uh, I kind of feel like our offensive coaches may not have paid attention to suggestions made by our uh, our offensive linemen, including uh, Len Haas, right. the center. Uh, uh, Manny Fernandez played on his nose and I think was a little quicker than Lynn. And uh, it was Manny who, who really blew up our offensive line. Uh, and we had a tendency, we had a, an understanding and could make adjustments at halftime. And I, I don't think those adjustments were made because coaches just didn't listen to what uh, the suggestions made by uh, our, the offensive linemen. We held them 14 points. Yeah. Hold, at that time, if you hold teams 14 points, you uh, we're win. supposed to win. We're supposed to win. Uh, and it, the the stage wasn't too big for us. the The defense played uh, played well, but we still we gave up 14 points. That was by far the least amount they scored all season. A couple of times they scored 16, but the rest of this year, uh, I mean, there's a there's a game in the 50s. There's a lot of games in the 30s. So, you hold into 14 points, you would think you would beat that Miami team. But let's get to the play. <laughs> the block kick. Gary O. Oh, yeah. To talk me through this play because we've seen it million – well, it's been out there millions of times. I know I've seen it plenty of times to where I remember as a kid reading books because I was I was all in on football. I was all about stats. I was all about – I knew – and, and you know, I, I'm an older guy now. I don't remember all that stuff. But I could tell you everything, every Super Bowl MVP, everything. But And like you said, when we talked, you were like, I can't believe you, you remember who I was. Like, you're crazy. Now. I didn't remember who you are. That was something I read over and over again and saw over and over again all through my childhood. Gary O'Priman starts to kick a field goal. It's it's blocked. Mm -hmm. uh, somehow it ends up back in his hands, and I don't know what he was trying. He was trying to throw the ball, but the punch up with the thing, and it lands right in your hands, and you take it from there. Well, uh, I have to go back a bit. Gary and I were with the Lions at the same time. <laughs> and the year I left to go to Washington, he left to go to Miami. So wow. you, you can. Uh, That's the irony there. It's irony, and you can tell uh, the <laughs> how bad the Lions were in not knowing the talent that they had. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Uh, and so Gara and I had been friends forever. Uh, and that play that you mentioned has been played every year. <laughs> the last 50 since 1972 exactly and i and i haven't made 10 cents off of that <laughs> <laughs> you know when you make only twelve thousand dollars a year you know? <laughs> yeah you need you need to get something done about that i didn't get a, get a dime off that play but uh, it goes to show you the type of coach that george allen was and in the in the amount of detail that he paid to all aspects of the game, including special teams. And uh, uh, I was on what you call the, the field goal block team or the uh, 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 after point, uh, uh, extra point block team. Right. And I, my position was uh, that of the spy man. The spy man, because you couldn't have both sides going in there trying to block the kick. Right. So I'm the spy man, and I look for the second thud. The first thud, the ball is kicked. The second thud means something has happened that's not good for whoever was kicking the ball. <laughs> and uh, so when I heard that, and I had kind of jogged in looking to see what was going on, getting ready to look and see the ball go through 
the uprights because that would have made the game, uh, they would have had 17 points and ironically could have ended up 17 and 0. Uh, as, as, as yeah. So uh, when I heard that second thud, I said, oh, something bad has happened for the offense. And immediately my eyes went to uh, went to Garrell. And uh, I saw, heck, he's <laughs> going to catch the ball. Here I get a chance to hit a kicker. <laughs> I get a chance. And so I bore down on him because I wanted to give him a, as much a, of a lick as I possibly could. After all, as a defensive back, most of the players were a lot bigger than me. Here's somebody. Here's somebody I can pick on. <laughs> <laughs> so I headed towards him. And uh, I saw him bat the ball up, uh, bat the ball, and then when he tried to throw the ball, it slipped out of his hands. And right then and there, I was almost on him. And I, as a defensive back, you learn to catch the ball at its highest point. And I went after that ball at its highest point. And the minute I got it, I knew that uh, there was not going to be anybody from the offensive team uh, uh, close to me. And I started down the sidelines, and I happened to see Garrow in one of my running back moves that uh, <laughs> I, I called on <laughs> from 20, 10 years before. Uh, I called on that move, and all I could think about was I, I can't lick. This damn kid. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. And, and so I, I, I went 49 yards, and it was a, a fumble. People a lot of times want to call it an interception, but because he bobbled the ball, it was called uh, it was called a fumble. Still right. remains the longest fumble return for uh, for a touchdown in the Super Bowl. But uh, still got that. Fighting. But again, we we lost the game. Nobody ever remembers who who, who came in second place. We right. lost the game, and as a pro, uh, second place is like kissing your sister. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So after that, you go on the next year. You end up five interceptions, third in most in the NFC, and then seventy four. You have your best season in pro football. You turn an interception for a touchdown against the Giants. You're all NFC first team, and the AP UPI Sport News named to the all NFL team, second team by the Associated Press. So after that year, you you end up retiring in '76. Mm -hmm. uh, what what made you decide to retire? Well, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of things go into that decision having uh, played and been paid to play a, a game. Right. And uh, uh, I had good years, but I, I was never a flamboyant player to begin with. Uh, I had a philosophy that uh, was based on respect for the people that you were playing against. And yes, I had interceptions, uh, made decent plays, got some honors, but uh, during that whole period, I never went to a Pro Bowl. Uh, I never knew how to jump all over the place when I scored a touchdown or something of that sort, because I felt like uh, I was playing against other pros and anything that I did to draw attention to myself would take away from the fact that that, D that receiver uh, who was a pro, uh, I looked at it as kind of ridiculing him. So I, I, it was my philosophy never to dance in, in the end zone. Now, going into uh, well, 1975, uh, I, we were playing a game against the Giants. And again, as you well know, there are things that you remember in your career. And I remember uh, trying to make a tackle on a running back by the name of, of uh, Joe Dawkins, who was just as hard a runner as some of them. I had tackled uh, 
uh, Gail Sayers. I had tackled uh, uh, j uh, just a number of, of uh, O.J. Simpson, all these guys, I, I, Calvin Hill and so forth. But in this particular instance, I made a tackle and my head was just a little too low. Oof. And and uh, I ended up uh, tearing the muscles uh, on, in my neck, both going across and down. Oh. And it was the first time in my career that I'd ever been knocked unconscious and had been carried off the field. But I came uh, and in I could remember going through the tunnel in on a stretcher. This was just unbelievable as far as I was concerned. But uh, in examining me, there I didn't have any permanent damage. I did initially suffer some paralysis, but it came back very, very quickly. But I, and uh, like a dummy, I got ready and played that very next game against the Cardinals. And I had a good game. I caused a fumble. Uh, in tackling Jim Otis, who uh, originally went to Ohio State. Uh, and I finished out the season. But I do remember against uh, uh, the Cowboys, I miss, missed a tackle on a very easy tackle on a, on a, and a, a short out pattern by the receiver, uh, where I, I, uh, I missed a tackle by... Uh, not feeling something in my arms. My arms just wouldn't close. And, mm. and uh, I really knew that I, I was hurt. Uh, and I tried getting ready to play the next season. And I would have made the team and probably would have uh, remained the starter. But uh, going into that training camp, we used to practice against the Philadelphia Eagles in Hershey, Pennsylvania. These were joint practice sessions. And during one of those sessions, I got hit in the chest and I almost had something like a whiplash. And the old pain in my neck came back. And I went to the sidelines and it was at that point that I contemplated, well, Mike, you've been bucking the odds for 10 years. Uh, this game is a violent game. and is it worth the risk just to play another season? And uh, I, uh, by the time we got back to training camp uh, in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, I said, made the decision that this was it. I was going to walk away with all my faculties and, and so forth. Uh, and that's when I, I uh, went in to see George and told him, and he tried to talk me out of it, which was the case with him because he was very loyal to his players. And he would keep players a couple of years past their prime to get them ready for retirement. But I, w I was young. I was 31 years old. Uh, and uh, I just said, George. And I was, a, not, I was not boisterous, but I, I considered myself a deep thinker. And when I said something, I meant it. And uh, uh, so I decided to walk away and not take the chance of, of being paralyzed or taking another hit. It was a difficult decision. Oh, definitely. The hardest decision I've ever made relating to football, but it was a difficult position. And I made it. And I'm not sorry that I did make that decision, although uh, I continue, even for 50 years, to relive plays. To the point where my wife has to wake me up. And you, didn't, you missed that tackle, Mike, that last time. <laughs> so you retire. Mm -hmm. uh, doing and, and reading this synopsis of your career, uh, played 104 consecutive games, like you said earlier. Gave up only eight touchdown passes, scored six touchdowns, four by interceptions, and was considered one of the smartest cornerbacks in the NFL. So. I mean, at 31, to retire early, I don't think that was a bad career at all. Well, it goes back. I know you just wish you could have got that ring, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, actually, I have here. I wear it all the time. This is oh, the Oh, wow. 
it's the, it's the NFC championship ring, but it is still the loser's ring. And that's the way I look at it. Well, we lost yeah. that, that game in the Super Bowl, even though we were the NFC champs. Yeah, a lot of guys don't get that chance, though. So you should be proud that you got to it. So then you leave, go to the Bahamas. Yep, yep. I, uh, operating hotels and coaching football. So how did that go? No, I was there in the Bahamas, particularly in Freeport, for 18 years after after playing. And uh, uh, I had an, I never coached before. But if you're a football player at the level that I played, it's hard to get football out of your uh, out of your bloodstream. It was just in my blood, and I had an opportunity to teach. As a matter of fact, I taught in the off season when I was uh, in my first year uh, at Detroit. I was a history and civics teacher, so I jumped. And my mother taught school for uh, over forty years. And my, my father was a doctor as well. But uh, uh, I jumped at the opportunity to teach these kids who uh, knew very little about football itself. But they learned, and I taught them as if they were going to be pros. And uh, they we enjoyed the experience. We won several championships. Uh, and to this day, even, uh, well, just about a month or so ago, uh, they honored me after 50 years, oh, wow. uh, and my wife and I went back to the Bahamas, Freeport in particular, and uh, uh, we lived some memories. And even though I call them my my kids, these are fellows now who are in their 40s and 50s. They'll <laughs> remember. Uh, they called me Brew Baker after some <laughs> movie that. Uh, 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 one of these, uh, because I was so that, up. that sounds for me. I'm going to have to look that up. <laughs> yeah, it, I, I know what you mean. I've been coaching. This is my 13th year now as a head coach. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was telling somebody yesterday, you, you get attached to them and they're like your kids. They really are like your kids. Yeah. And I still hear from a lot of them from my first team. Uh, so, yeah. And now they're, you know, these guys are getting married, having kids and, uh, it's, it's it's the closest thing to getting back on the field that that's you can it. have. And that and that's what, you know, you want to teach these guys. And when you see one of those kids get it, like those eyes light up, that's what makes all the difference there. That's what makes it worthwhile. Yeah, so, you're absolutely right. It's an awesome thing to do. So you end up, like we said, you, you 2002, you're selected as one of the 70 greatest Redskins of all time, which I think is quite an honor with, the, that history of the Redskins, you know, you, you got guys like Sonny Jerks and Sam Huff, John Riggins, Joe Theismann, uh, Art Monk, all these guys, and you're right there in those 70s. So, I, and like I said, when you told me, I, ca I can't believe somebody remember that's that's crazy to me that you don't think somebody remembers. Every, I know a, a true NFL football fan remembers Mike Bass for sure. I've got a few quick hitting questions and then i'm gonna let you plug whatever you want to sure so okay these are going to be a little bit different it may be something out of sports and it may be something not out of sports i'll switch it up okay favorite meal my favorite meal and i i love fried chicken my wife knows how to uh, <laughs> how to make well you know we've been we were in in grade school together. Okay. Pictures. Uh, she's six months older than I am, so she's a cougar. I tell her that. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. Oh man! Oh man! Can she cook? She and she knows just what I like. And I, whenever I'm I'm in in a dilemma, she knows those things to to bring me out of it and that's what a good woman does for you exactly just like you said happy life happy wife <laughs> right right uh favorite sport to watch i love watching uh women's basketball i find it amazing that these women can do the things that i've seen men do and come to expect them to do but when you see the athleticism of these women 
who I think are just tremendous athletes and they're getting their due. It's just unfortunate that the NBA uh, doesn't make their salaries commensurate with the NBA players. If that were the case, then there would not have been a need uh, for that young lady to go over to Russia or go to outside the U.S. to play anywhere, uh, Brittany Griner. I'm 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 like you. Uh, you know, I was an NBA fan for a long time, mm-hmm. and I just cannot watch it anymore. It's not, they don't they play all offense, no defense. But those ladies, oh they man, play both sides of the court. And, and I'll tell you what else, I love uh, women's softball as well. I just appreciate. Uh, uh, the unexpected. You don't expect to see the athleticism. And, ago- and of course, uh, 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 there is a, uh, continues to be a lack of respect for for our women. I agree. And, uh, I agree. and that's another story. That yeah, exactly. Rides, that's a, we could rides. have a long show about that. Well, I've got two sisters. Uh, and I've got two daughters, and uh, my mother was a very, very strong woman. And those things should be appreciated to the point where men uh, should know when and how to keep themselves out of that situation uh, of deciding what is good for a woman as opposed to uh, anything else. You cannot, you cannot put yourself uh, in that, but it's such a big mistake, and it's going to it's going to cause a lot of people some some heartache uh, on one side, but it's going to cause a lot of people who are now holding office to take uh, go back to uh, to to second base. Exactly. Toughest wide receiver you covered? I covered some great wide receivers, uh, uh, Bob Hayes, Paul Warfield. But the toughest one to me was Mel Gray. Oh, wow. Yeah. Mel Gray was a receiver with the St. Louis Cardinals. Yeah. uh, Who was extremely fast, but extremely quick. And uh, those are the receivers that gave me a difficult time because I could not take a false step. If I took a false step, he was on his way to the house. (laughs) Uh, and he could, he was so fast that he could get me to turn my hips. Uh, and that's one of the things that you try not to do as a defensive back if you're running backwards. That's right. Okay. Coke or Pepsi? Uh, Pepsi. Ah, that's, see, that's right. <laughs> Favorite place to play besides RFK? I love to play against uh, the Giants. Okay. Love to play in the history of Yankee Stadium. Yeah. Uh, uh, when you knew you were there in a place where uh, not only Sam Huff made his name, but also Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, uh, Mickey Mantle, uh, Elston Huff, that was uh, just amazing to me. And and uh, to be honest with you, uh, when you get, one of the greatest things I ever uh, was able to get was uh, uh, coming. There were two things. I, I was on an airplane on my way to New York, and I met uh, 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 Jackie Kennedy, Jackie Onassis. Oh wow! Was, she sat across the the aisle from me. And she was she was a Redskin fan, <laughs> and she knew who I was. <laughs> See there? See there? <laughs> and the other thing was getting off of the the shuttle from New York uh, at Washington National, and uh, walking in front of me about about ten paces or so, with a pigeon-toed walk behind. Uh, there I was walking behind Jackie Robinson. Oh wow! And, and I, I I stopped him and asked him for his oh. autograph, and he was so gracious, so so. That's, that's awesome. 
So uh -huh. those were great moments. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> All right. Lake or ocean? Ocean. Okay. Ocean. Favorite, favorite movie? Uh, the Sting. Okay. I got you. And last thing we're going to ask you. Favorite memory as a Washington Redskin? The, uh, those mem actually, they are memories. And these were the, the jumping up and down and yelling and uh, uh, singing in, in the locker room after a victory. I mean, George would come in three uh, cheers yeah. for the Redskins. Yep. Uh, and, and it was so that camaraderie, uh, I, I spoke just a couple of weeks ago with, uh, Bill Malinchek, uh, and he was a special teams player, but he was a wide receiver with me in Detroit. He was first round choice. Then I, he was on the team, but I couldn't make the team in Detroit, but he came to Washington and made a name for himself as uh, as a special team specialist in blocking punts uh yeah, but that is essentially that that's it that's it that's that's awesome right there so before we let you go anything you want to plug or and, and let's talk about where people can find you uh online well i have a personal website which is called mikebass41.com www mikebass41.com. I invite people to go to the website. You'll get an opportunity to uh, get a feel for how I grew up, my family. Uh, education has always been very, very important to us. Um, both my sisters have their master's degrees. My youngest sister is also a doctor. She has her doctorate. My, uh, her son is, is a surgeon at Cedar sinai in, uh, in uh, L.A., Los Angeles. My two daughters have their master's degrees, uh, and they tease me about being the dumbest person in the family. <laughs> <laughs> my, my mother was a teacher. My, da my dad taught. Uh, my dad practiced medicine for, for 50, 60 years. So uh, on that website, you get a lot of information about me, but one of the things I'd really like people to do is go through the site and join uh, Mike's Club. That is a, a, a program in which I impart a lot of the information that we've gone over today. Uh, if you go to the menu on the right-hand side, there, uh, down towards the bottom, you'll see a link that says Mike's Club. And therein, every week, You'll get something that's relating to me and football and so forth and so on. But you just, it's free to sign up, not charging anything. But I just give you some impactful information about uh, football, uh, my relationship with my players, my relationship with players that I played against, all sorts of things that I think you'll find interesting. And I'm also, I've got an apparel line. <laughs> I'm Let's looking go. at that right now. I'm looking at it right now. I sure. like this. I like this. Yeah, you'll be able to get uh, hats and and hoodies and all sorts of things like that. Uh, so just visit me. I appreciate it. I want to say one final thing. Go ahead. I have two grandsons. Uh, one grandson is uh, 14 years old, and he's six five. I don't know where in the hell he got all that. Where where does he go? And does he want to play football for me? <laughs> well, <laughs> he's a basketball player. Okay, he's well, yeah, I can't blame him there at six five. But my uh, my oldest grandson is seventeen. He's going into his senior year. He is uh, uh, re he plays football. He's six two two and a quarter, and he's gotten some offers from uh, some small colleges because I think he's playing out of position. He needs to be an outside linebacker. You so heard it, that right. The coach, coach, you heard that right. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to Mr. Bass. He knows what he's talking about. His name is Cornelius Bass. So Cornelius Bass. Cornelius Bass. He's at Edgewater High School, but he may be 
coming to Gainesville, Florida uh, and spending that last year with me. And if he does, then I'm going to help the East Side High School uh, in their in their coaching as a volunteer. Got you. Uh, the, I'm going to uh, keep up with East, East Side High School. East Side High School, yeah. Uh, right down now. Football's in my blood, man. Football. Yes, sir. Once you get it in there, it's hard to get it out. If you want to get it out. But yeah, I like this. Uh, I like this logo on the hat too. The interception hat up here. That's that's pretty cool. You uh, know, that's why I'm cool. that I'm intercepting the ball against. That's awesome, there, guys. You make sure you check out his website, MikeBass41.com, and like you said, sign up for uh, Mike's Club. Check him out. And Mr. Bass, I can't say, I can't even express to you how how good of a time I've had with you today. I, like I said before, I love hearing these stories. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. I can't thank you enough for coming uh, on. Steve, thank you. I, I do appreciate your having me. And I, I enjoy reliving some of these things and hopefully – some of those fellas on your football team will recognize that just with a little extra effort, they'll be able to beat out that starter who may think that he can't be beat out. Exactly. Exactly. No, no position is, is, is submitted where you don't have to work for that job. That's right. I tell them that you got to work no yep. matter what you did the year before you got to work this year. That's right. That's right. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Bass. Hang around for just a second. He said, guys, that is Mike Bass on the final score.